We're going to finish up 1 Samuel 14, Lord willing, here this evening. An awful lot happens. This is a longer chapter here, as we've been going through, 52 verses total. Um, at the beginning of this chapter, it starts with a, a massive Philistine army camped in the middle of Israel. You remember this? The Bible says that there was a certain number of, of chariots, a certain number of horsemen, and, and infantry as the sands of the sea, which means an awful lot. Uh, they're encamped in the middle of Israel in Michmash, which you see up on the map, that's in the inset. It's about four miles from Gibeah, which is where Saul is. The, the Israelite army had started out with about 3,000 men armed with farming implements. They only had two swords for 6,000, or for 3,000. Uh, they, and th those two swords were in the hands of Saul and Jonathan, his son. So not a very well-equipped army. Uh, but as the Philistines kept doing what they were doing and sending out raiding parties, the Israelites lost their morale and, and they started to desert. Uh, some of them went and hid in the hills. Some of them went across Jordan. And just to get away from it all, they were running away. And so Saul is left in Gibeah under a pomegranate tree with 600 men. And they're all sitting there and they're waiting when Jonathan, that's Saul's oldest son, who's a man of faith and he knows that God can deliver by many or by few in verse 6. Jonathan and his armor bearer go over in faith and they assault the Philistine positions at Michmash. It goes well. It shouldn't have gone well from a human standpoint. Militarily, it was a disaster. But According to verse 6, he said, God can save by many or few, and God decided to save by few. God gave them a victory, two men against innumerable hosts. That's, that's all God there. God sent an earthquake. God sent chaos into the ranks of the Philistines, and they began to run in every direction while fighting and killing themselves. So Saul and Saul, or Jonathan and his armor bearer kind of got the ball rolling. Uh, in faith, and God just kept it going. And the Philistines are, are in a mad dash trying to get home, which uh, on our map here you can see where Philistia is. They're up here in Michmash, so they're running west towards the Mediterranean, towards Philistia, trying to get away from the Israelites, trying to, to get back to their homes. Well, word of what is happening among the Philistines makes it back to Saul and Gibeah. And he conducts a little, uh, a little check and discovers who's gone. And, of course, who is gone is Jonathan and his armor bearer. And Saul's first reaction is found in verse 18. Let's take a look at it. It says, And Saul said unto Ahiah, remember, Ahiah is of the priestly line. He's, he's a Levitical priest of the line of Eli, of the beginning of 1 Samuel. This would be his great-grandson says, said unto Ahiah, bring hither the ark of God. For the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. And it came to pass, while, while Saul talked unto the priest, that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priest, withdraw thou thine, withdraw thine hand. Okay, so his, his instinct was good. When, when he was faced with this tremendous amount of stress, all of this trouble, he, he started to seek the face of God, but he was quickly distracted, and he said, no, 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 enough of this, we need, to, we need to do something, okay? And we talked about this at length, when, when somebody says, we've just got to do something, usually, you shouldn't do anything. Usually, you should stop, and you should seek guidance from the Lord. Well, Saul and his army, they, they walk away from Ahiah, they walk away from, from seeking God's face on it, and they do take action. They give chase to the Philistines, but when he's caught up in the excitement of the moment, Saul gives an oath to his army. Verse 24, I'm going over this quickly because this is review. Verse 24, the men of Israel were distressed that day. You'd say, why were they distressed? They were winning. Well, because Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening. <laughs> what on earth? They're working. They're, they're going. It's, I, I've showed you pictures of this area. It's hilly. This is the central highlands of Israel, and, and they're going. It's four miles 
from, from Gibeah to Michmash, and then from Michmash to, to Ajalon, which is where the fight ends, it's, it's 10 or 12 miles, and that's if you walk it straight. So he's got men who are fighting, going up and down hills, and Saul said, don't, don't eat, don't eat. Uh, he says, uh, cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. They listened. The battle goes well for the Israelites. They chase the Philistines, verse 31, and they smote the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon. And the people were very faint. Okay, they were, the, that word means swooning. So they, they're trying to fight. They just don't have the, the, the calories to do what they need to do. And the reason they don't have the calories is because their king said nobody's allowed to eat. Jonathan and his armor bearer <clears throat> reconnect with the main body of the Israelite troops, which had grown. You remember reading this last week? They started out with 600, and their army kept getting bigger. All of the deserters started to come back. When they saw things going well, they, they started crawling out from under the holes, uh, out from under the rocks, now the holes, now the hills, and coming back. And so Jonathan and his armor bearer, uh, uh, they come back, they, they reconnect. And Jonathan walks up, and there's honey on the ground in this one particular area of woods. Well, he hadn't heard the oath that Saul had made, so he reached out, and he ate of the honey. And verse 29 tells us that as a result of this, his eyes were enlightened. What's that mean? That they, they were faint before. Now he's got energy. Now he's doing good. He's got, he's got what he needs. Just physically speaking, you can't, you can't go all day and not eat doing what they're doing. Well, finally, evening came. And remember, Saul's oath was, don't eat until evening. Okay, That would be when the Jewish day ends and the people were starving. And there's all of this spoil of the Philistines. And so the people, it, it says that they flew on the spoil. They, they started grabbing the animals that the Philistines left behind, and they're slaughtering them, and they're eating them with the blood, is the words that are told us here in Scripture. They're not properly draining them. And we talked about this last week. God makes a big deal about blood, right? In Leviticus, in Deuteronomy, he says, don't eat, with, don't eat your meat with the blood because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Blood is a big deal to God. And so the people are sinning against God in this, in this moment of frenzied eating. Well, Saul sees what's happening. And so he arranges a way for the animals to be slaughtered in accordance with the law. And then the people start, they, they carry on eating. All of this, uh, again, all of this just review bringing us up to where we are. Finally, uh, in verse 35, Saul builds his first and as far as we know from the biblical record, his only altar to the Lord. This is the only time that he built an altar in verse 35. He's looking for guidance from God in verse 35. Remember, earlier he was, he was looking for, in, in, chapter, in verse 19, he, he was in the midst of seeking God's guidance. And then he heard the Philistines. He said, withdraw now thine hand. Okay, enough. We got we to do something. Now he's looking for God's guidance, so he builds this altar. His desire is not to lose momentum. He wants to rally the troops and chase the Philistines all the way back to their land. Let's, let's pick up in verse 36. And Saul said, let us go down after the Philistines by night and spoil them until the morning light. And let us not leave a man of them. And they said, do whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. So... He's got popular opinion on his side, right? They've got momentum. The Philistines have been, they've been running from Michmash, and they've been killing themselves. And, and Saul says, let's, let's keep a good thing going. Let's run after them. Let's, let's wipe them all out. Then we won't have to deal with them. And the people say, that sounds good. Let's do it. Then the priest, then said the priest, let us draw near hither unto God. Does that sound like a good idea to you? That sounds like a real good idea to me. Okay? That's what he should have done to start with. I would imagine, and I don't have this on, on biblical grounds, 
But I would imagine that if Saul had been seeking God's face from the very beginning, he wouldn't have been sitting under a pomegranate tree in Gibeah. But again, that's just me kind of reading between the lines a little bit, okay? So the priest says, let us draw near hither unto God. And Saul does, verse 37, and Saul asks counsel of God. Shall I go down after the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he, God, answered him not that day. He, he went to God earlier, and he cut, he cut it off. He said, no, no, we got to do something. Now he comes to God when he's got time, and God will not answer him. And Saul is concerned about this because this brings us to, to new material tonight. Look at verse 38. Saul is going to conduct a witch hunt. It's the best way I know how to describe it. And Saul said, verse 38, Draw ye near hither all the chief of the people, and now and, and, and know and see wherein this sin hath been this day. Saul's looking for why God didn't answer it. <laughs> he, he says... I, I built this altar, and I went to God in prayer, and he didn't answer me, so somebody is to blame for this. And he says, you bring everybody in. We're going we're gonna to find out where the sin is in the camp. Rather than looking inwardly, taking just a moment of introspection, looking in the mirror, Saul turns his gaze to others first. Verse 39, Saul's still talking. For as the Lord liveth, which saveth Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among all the people that answered him. Saul doesn't know. He doesn't know what Jonathan did. He doesn't know anything about the honey in the wood that, that Jonathan dipped the, the end of his rod in and ate. He doesn't know any of that. Saul's just talking. He's, he's making a point from a, from a purely human standpoint, which is the eyes that Saul is looking through. From a purely human standpoint, who's the hero of this, this battle? Jonathan, right? Jonathan and his armor bearer, they were the ones who got everything started. And so Saul is, is standing next to his son proudly, and he says, look, even if it's Jonathan, what he doesn't know is it's Jonathan. But he doesn't know that. He's just talking. Okay? He's talking kind of off the top of his head. He says, look, even if it's Jonathan, he'll, he'll die for this. In his attempt to sound as serious as possible, Saul points to the hero of the day, his son. Now, did you, did you notice what Saul just did again? This is becoming a pattern for him. He just made a decision based on impulse and in the heat of the moment. <laughs> he doesn't get an answer from God. Well, there must be somebody who, who sinned. Bring him out. Even if it's my son Jonathan, he'll die for it. He's, he's making hasty, impulsive mistakes at a, at a faster clip right now. Notice his language, though. Here, here in verse 39, he says, For as... The Lord liveth, Lord, Jehovah, as the Lord liveth, remember those words. They're going to come back in just a minute, and they're going to bite him. Verse 40, then said he, this is still Saul talking, unto all Israel, be ye on one side, and I and Jonathan my son will be on the other side. Okay? Okay? He's not looping himself in with the people. He's got a, he's got a we, they kind of a thing going on here. He's, he's, he's having Jonathan stand next to him. And, and me and Jonathan, we're going to find who sinned and, and they're going to die. Okay? Again, Saul doesn't know that he's standing next to the one who he's, he's angry at. He says, Be ye on one side, and I and Jonathan my son will be on the other side. And the people said unto Saul, Do what seemeth good unto thee. Who, who does know? Saul doesn't know. Who does know? Jonathan. Jonathan. Who else knows? Who was there when he, when he dipped in an eighth 
armor bearer. The, yeah, the armor bearer and the people. The only one who doesn't know is Saul, the guy who's doing all the talking and making all the big decisions. He's the only guy without the information that is needed to make the decisions and make the pronouncements that he's making. He's talking a really big game, and the people are letting him do it. He's, have, have you ever heard that if you give somebody enough rope, they'll hang themselves? That's what he's doing. And the people, a nation of people, is letting him do it. He's talking, and he's, he's, he's digging in. Nobody's willing to speak up and tell Saul that Jonathan had broken his oath. So in a moment of self-righteousness, Saul divides himself and his son from the rest of the people in order to find out who's to blame. Why won't God talk to me? Somebody out there, <laughs> and he's pointing out, somebody out there is to blame for this. Verse 41. Therefore Saul said unto the Lord God of Israel, give a perfect lot. And God did. And Saul and Jonathan were taken, but the people escaped. So Jonathan and Saul are standing up here. They're, they're separate from all the, all the little people. And they cast lots, and the lot falls on Saul and Jonathan. Well, Saul's standing there, and he's, he's probably getting a little bit worried. His stomach probably turns a flip when, when that lot is drawn, and he realizes, uh-oh. <laughs> Well, it can't be me, right, would be, would be his thought. As a matter of fact, that is what he thought. It's interesting, quickly, casting of lots was common in situations like this. This wasn't unbiblical. It, it, it is very, uh, very precedented in Scripture. A little bit later in the Bible, in Jonah chapter 1, verse 7, you remember that's how the sailors discovered that it was Jonah who was to blame for the storm when he was running from God. But the lots are cast, and surprise, surprise, Saul and Jonathan's name is on the one taken. So, Saul, verse 42, Saul said, Cast lots between me and Jonathan, my son. <laughs> he, he's not getting it real fast here. Cast lots between us, and Jonathan was taken. Can you imagine the collective gasp that went through the crowd? This is happening in front of people. And, and so there's this, <gasps> he's going to know. Verse 43, then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what thou hast done. And Jonathan told him and said, I did but taste a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand, and lo, I must die. Because <laughs> he heard his dad talking. He, he, his dad had just used him, without knowing, had just used him as an example. He had just said, even if it's Jonathan, I'll kill him. And Jonathan says, it was me. I, I ate some honey, and now I must die. Now, did Jonathan know about this oath? No, he had to be informed later. So in, in absolute innocency, he, he had broken uh, his father's ridiculous oath. So if, if Saul had stopped for a second and thought it through, again, impulsive decisions make for problems later. If Saul would have stopped and thought, I'm going to have men fighting all day. Should I take away their rations? What, what would logic tell you? No, I probably shouldn't do that. I should probably let them eat. But in a, in a moment of impulse, he made a bad decision. And now he's, he's digging the hole even deeper. Why didn't Jonathan know about the oath real quick, just, just, to, just to drive this all the way home? Why didn't he know? He, he was out fighting Philistines. Where was Saul when he made this oath? Sitting under a pomegranate tree in Gibeah. His son was out doing the work. He was sitting under a pomegranate tree making bad decisions. But he doubles down. He, somewhere along the line, Saul has to realize, oh, man, <laughs> I was wrong, but he doesn't say, you know what? I've been wrong. He doubles down. Look at this. Does Saul realize the idiocy of his oath and cry out to God to forgive him? Nope. Verse 44. 
And Saul answered, God do so and more also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. <laughs> There's a father's love for you, huh? What is, what is this? This is pride, just pure and simple. He's, he's, he started out with a bad impulsive decision, followed by more bad impulsive decisions, and now in front of everybody, he's made great big prideful statements, and now he's, he's determined to carry it through and, and execute his son, his oldest son, Hmm. Verse 45. And the people said unto Saul, Shall Jonathan die, who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid. As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he hath wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, that he died not. Saul might be caught up in the moment. Saul might be stuck, stuck in his self-righteous fog. But the people are having none of it. They declare, God forbid. Now we see that in the New Testament a lot. In the Old Testament, it means the same thing. It means far be it. <laughs> no way. Absolutely not. Notice, notice what they say there in the middle of that verse. They say, God forbid... As the Lord liveth. You, you remember those words being used? Maybe in, in verse 39 by Saul. Where he's talking about, oh, as the Lord liveth. This is going to happen. And the people now pull those same words out. They say, nothing doing. You're not killing Jonathan. You're not doing this. It says, for he hath wrought with God this day. We'll touch on this in a few minutes. But that's a pretty awesome statement. Did, did Jonathan win the fight because he was, he was just a macho guy? Because he was really good with a sword? No. He, he won because he was fighting with God. He, he and his armor bearer and God went out and picked a fight with a far outnumbering Philistine force. And, and God won. And the people realize that. They, they don't even give Jonathan the glory. They say, he's been fighting with God. You're not touching him. They're, they're saying this to their king. Saul didn't get it, but the people understood. It's possible that Saul felt the reason that Israel didn't push the victory to its utmost extent was because Jonathan had broken his oath. He might have genuinely been so deluded that he thought the reason that God won't hear me now is because my son broke an oath. He, he might genuinely have thought that. Jonathan had gone up to fight with the Philistines declaring in verse 6, it may be that the Lord will save, will, will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. The victory this day had nothing to do with Jonathan's prowess. It had nothing to do with Saul's oath. Okay? Did Saul's oath help God? No, it hurt his men. His men needed food and he withheld it from them. Okay? Saul's oath had nothing to do with it. But the end result of this act of mass noncompliance they saved Jonathan from his father's self-righteous anger. I'm glad they did. I'm glad they stood up. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be a terrible thing if, if the people had said, well, he's whatever. Well, it would have, been, been, would have been awful. We'd have lost <laughs> some, some pretty awesome stories that are coming that involve Jonathan. The aftermath is found in verse 46. Then Saul went up from following the Philistines... And the Philistines went to their own place. Without the Israelites chasing them, the Philistines had survived. They made their way back to their homes, their own country, along the coast of the Mediterranean. And the, the, the Jews went home. The Philistines went home. And most everybody's going to live to fight another day. Look at verse 47. This, this is just... 
it, it's kind of like the epilogue here of this story. It says, so Saul took the kingdom over Israel and fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the children of Ammon, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, and against the Philistines, and whithersoever he turned himself, he vexed them. Here is the situation for Saul. Okay? Gibeah would be in this area right here between, between Jerusalem and Jericho. In that region is where Saul's headquarters were in Gibeah. And you see he's got Moab. Now Moab, they're the descendants of, of Lot, remember, by his incestuous relationship with one of his daughters. Ammon. Ammon is the other descendant of Lot by his other daughter. Then you have the kings of Zobah. They're in the north. Up there, they're, they're kind of, uh, they, they don't have a, a specific land. They're just kind of rogue kings that are out there, raider kings. Philistia, they have this portion of land here on the, on the western coast of Israel, on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean. They're, they're kind of in a strip of land there. If you watch the news now and you hear them talk about the Gaza Strip, the Gaza Strip is Philistia. Okay. Then you have the Amalekites. We'll, we'll read about them in just a second. They're in the next verse. And then you have Edom. Edom is down here in this region, down below the Dead Sea. If you see where, where the map says Beersheba, if you hear about them talking, hear them talking about the Negev, that's that region right there. It's desert, uh, but Israel in recent days has irrigated it, and they've, they've got a, a great amount of agriculture going on there. So Saul's right there in the middle. Do you notice anything about his military position? He's surrounded. If he's looking for a fight, which direction does he have to go? Yeah, they can't get away. They've got him surrounded, right? They're, they're everywhere. He, he can go and find the enemies of God just about anywhere. Verse 48, take a look at it. And he gathered an host and smote the Amalekites and delivered Israel out of the hands of them that spoiled them. Now, this is talking about what happens in the next chapter. In 1 Samuel 15, that's where we fall, find Saul going out against the Amalekites. So we'll read about that particular campaign uh, next week. Let's skip ahead and look at verse 52, because it, it dovetails very well with what we're looking at right here in verses 47 and 48. It says, And there was sore war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. Okay? And we will find that to be the case. Who will finally defeat the Philistines and beat them back so that they don't present a national threat to Israel? David, David will. Okay? And David's son, Solomon, will live. Uh, he will expand the empire and he will have true peace. Won by his father, but Saul won't really have that. There's going to be very intense war, very intense conflict between the Philistines there in the south and Israel all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him unto him. Now, this is a direct fulfillment of 1 Samuel 8. If you remember in 1 Samuel 8, Samuel was talking to the children of Israel and they said, give us a king like the nations of the world. He said, this is the kind of king you'll have. He said to them, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. Saul builds his army through conscription. Okay? Not, not quite the draft, but conscription. He's, he just, when he sees somebody who he likes and he thinks they'd fit in well in the army, he takes them and, and puts them in the army. And, and if they don't want to... Welcome to the Volunteer Corps, right? You, thank you for volunteering is what's going on here. This is, this is going to give us these few verses, verses 47 uh, down through verse 48 and then verse 52, give us a picture of, of Saul's reign. This is as, as it were if we were to suddenly back up on the rest of the book of 1 Samuel. A lot of what we're going to be reading about in the chapters to come is kind of summarized right here. Saul's going to be fighting against the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites and the Amalekites and the Philistines and the kings of Zobah. He's going to be fighting against all of these people. 
He doesn't have to go far to find a fight because he's surrounded, militarily speaking. But God includes in here a little, a little bit about Saul's family. Take a look at verse 49. Now the sons of Saul were Jonathan and Ishui and Melchishua, and the names of his two daughters were these. The name of the first, Merab, the name of the younger, Michael. <clears throat> now here's, here's a chart of what we have of the family of Saul. We'll read, we'll read a little bit more in just a moment. Jonathan and Michael are going to play a major role in this book, in 1 Samuel. There's another son of Saul who's not mentioned here. He's over here on the, on the far right, Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth is going to be one of the sons of Saul. When, when Saul dies with his sons in battle on Mount Gilboa, and Solomon uh, and David comes and he takes takes over the kingdom, Ishbosheth is going to rise in power, and he's going he's gonna to have kind of a, a little uh, fiat kingdom for a little bit. Okay, That's one of the sons of Saul. But you have two daughters, uh, then you have Jonathan, but the, the two of his children that will play the biggest role in the story of 1 Samuel is going to be Jonathan and Michael. What, what happens, where will we hear about Michael? She marries David, right? Where do we hear about Jonathan? He's David's best friend. Very, very close relationship that they develop. We don't know anything more about these other kids. Ishwi and Melchishua and Merab. We don't know anything about them. We would assume they lived a pretty good life as children of the king. Saul will also, I don't have it up here, I'll expand this as we go. Saul has a concubine, and he has, he has other children as well. But these are his children by Ahinoam. Verse 50, and the name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahimaaz. And the name of the captain of his host was Abner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. And Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, was the, was the son of Abiah. So it's kind of a backwards family tree here a little bit. It, it starts with Saul and it goes down and then it starts with Saul and it goes up. Okay. So Abner is the brother of Kish, who is the son of Ner, who is the son of Abiel. Okay. Now, Abner, where, do we, where will we hear that name an awful lot? He, he's going to be Saul's chief, chief army commander. He's going to be the commander of, of Saul's army. Okay, so Saul, we don't know a whole lot more about Kish. Don't, don't know what happens to him. His name, as you're going through, sometimes uh, in the Old Testament, it leaves off the H, and it's just Kish. Okay, but that same, same man. So here we have the, the family tree of Saul and what's going on. Some of these names are going to play a fairly important role in the life of Saul and of David, because very, very soon... Uh, we're, going to, we're going to bring in David, and we're going to see how David and Saul interact. Do they get along well? Starts out good, though, right? Yeah. But it doesn't end well, as you remember. As I was studying for this, it, it, it came into my mind. How long ago was Saul a good king? How many, how many years was it? between when Saul was a good king and where we are now, when he's making all of these ridiculous decisions and, and threatening to kill his son. How, how many years? How many decades? It, it was weeks, maybe. It's so short a matter of time. It, it took very little to get from, from a humble man now, now there, was, there were some years from when he started. This wasn't right after his, his coronation. But, but he was a good king not long ago. And man, he's, he's going downhill fast, isn't he? It seems like just a couple weeks ago, we were talking about how he was a humble man who was passing the glory onto God and being merciful. And now suddenly he's, he's making impulsive decisions and threatening the life of his children. Pretty amazing as we track his, his rapid ascent and then a fairly rapid descent. But he's going to go 
so much lower as we continue on. Question. Where should Saul have begun his search for sin in the camp? With a mirror. <laughs> he, should have, he should have said, there's a problem. And, and it could be me. Leaders should always do that, shouldn't they? When there's a problem, he should have looked at himself. He also should have known God and I are, are not, we're, we're not in a good relationship right now. The problem's probably me, but he doesn't. His impulsive decisions and willingness to go ahead without God was the main problem that Israel, Israel's victory was not as complete as it might have been. If Saul had been walking with God, it wouldn't have gone like this. Again, I, I, would, I would make the case, again, and I'm reading between the lines, I would make the case that if Saul was walking with God, he wouldn't have been sitting under a pomegranate tree on his hands. He'd have been up doing something. But he wasn't walking with God. And that's just the start of, of the problem here. When Saul found himself in a corner because of his pride, he doubled down and tried to justify himself by executing his son. Proverbs 16, 18 tells us, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Saul is in free fall right now. He's making bad decisions, he's threatening the life of his children, and it just gets worse. When we introduce David into the picture, it's, it's still not going to go well. Uh, it, incidentally, when, when David comes into the picture... When the Philistines are again causing problems in the valley of Elah, where is Saul? Well, he's sitting again in another place, but he's sitting again. This, this is a, a repeat offender in this. Our tendency when we find ourselves in sin is to attempt to cover ourselves by justifying and by rationalizing what we've done. We, we find ourselves in sin, we say, well, I'm not really wrong. Or if we can't get out and say, well, I'm not really wrong, we'll say, here's, here's why I was wrong. Is either one of those okay? Is it right to justify and is it right to rationalize sin? Never ends well. Under what conditions does God say you can sin? Absolutely none. Okay? And, and this is true in the Old Testament. This is true in the New Testament. This is true today. There, there is no excuse where it's okay. Well, well, I, I lied and cheated and stole, and here's why. You don't have a good reason to do those things. It's never right to do wrong. Okay? I think it was Bob Jones Sr. of years gone by who said it's never right to do wrong in order to get a chance to do right. That's how we would rationalize it, right? Well, I did it so that I could do the greater good. No, nope. never right to do wrong. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. That's what we're trying to do when we try to justify and rationalize. We're trying to cover our sin. No, well, you don't understand. I have extenuating circumstances. No, you don't. No, I don't. We don't have extenuating circumstances. It's not okay. Whosoever, uh, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. That's what we want. Uh, I don't want to, to be justified in the eyes of men. I want God's mercy. When I find myself in sin, I should stop and confess and get right with God, not double down. That's what Saul does. He finds himself in sin, so he says, well... <laughs> Let's do this. We'll kill Jonathan. And the people say, no, no. You doing that doesn't make that right. Stop. The people of Israel realized something that Saul didn't about Jonathan's victory over the Philistines. We, we mentioned it in verse 5, 45. It says, for he hath wrought with God this day. He's been fighting on God's team. That's why he won. We're not going to kill him. You know, it's our privilege to work with God every day. We get to do what Jonathan did. And we even have a verse that tells us many verses, but this one says it more clearly than most. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, for we are laborers together with God. 
You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. If you're going to accomplish great things in life, use, use the ability that you have to work alongside God. Work in God's work. If you're going in the same direction as God, why did Jonathan, why was Jonathan able to have great victory over the Philistines? Because God wanted to have a great victory over the Philistines, and he used Jonathan to do it. When, when I set out to do what God wants me to do, I'm going to find that I'm fighting with God. I'm fighting on his team. I'm, I'm a laborer together with God. Who could have beat Jonathan in this setting when he's fighting on the same side as God? Nobody. We'll see David's going to do this in the Valley of Eli in chapter 17. He's going to go down there and he's going to go against a real big guy who's real good at killing people. And David's going to go down there with God. And does Goliath even stand a chance? Not even a little bit. Why? Because David's fighting on God's team. And Jonathan was fighting on God's team. And you and I, we get to fight on God's team. If we're walking with the Lord, if we're walking in the Spirit, like we've talked about in Sunday school, if we're walking with the Lord, and we've got that fellowship with Him, and we let Him guide us into the, into the fights that are worth having, and we're on His side, we're on His team, we can't lose. Just like... It, just like with Jonathan. Now, if Saul would have tried it, it probably would have gone different because Saul wasn't walking with the Lord. And if you go to war against God, you can't win. But if you go to war with God on your side or on his side, you can't lose. God's the only real hero of this story. But God used Jonathan because Jonathan stepped out in faith and made himself available. Jonathan was one of the only two who had a sword. And he was the only one of those two who was willing to use it. And he made it available. He said, God, you can do it with many or you can do it with few. Here's my sword. I'll go. And God worked to victory. That's what God's looking for in our lives as well. Any thoughts or any questions that you have on what we've covered here in chapter 14 of 1 Samuel? Next week, we're going to go into 1 Samuel 15, and we're going to see Saul go to war against the Amalekites. He's, he's going to have a divine commission. God's going to tell him, do this, and we'll see how he obeys. If you've read ahead or if you know the story, you know how this, how this goes. But Samuel's going to put in an appearance in chapter 15, one of, one of, his, um, one of his more violent uh, appearances that we find in the pages of Scripture. Let's bow for a word of prayer here this evening. Our Father God, we thank you for your word and for the stories that it contains. Lord, I pray that we would learn the lessons, the good ones and the bad ones, that we would learn from the, the bad experience of Saul, that we would understand that it's pointless and futile to try to go out independent of you. Lord, I pray that we would wait, that we wouldn't make impulsive decisions, that we wouldn't allow pride to blind us, and that when we find ourselves in sin, that we wouldn't seek to justify and, and rationalize them, but Lord, that we would confess and find mercy. I pray that we would learn the lessons of Jonathan as well, Lord, that we would be willing to expend everything for you, that we would place ourselves at your disposal, Allow you to use whatever talents you've given to us. I pray that you would, uh, would use us as individuals, use us as a church, Lord. I pray as we go our separate ways, I pray that we would, would be such uh, beacons of light and truth that, that we would be an example to the world around us of what you can do in the life of a Christian. And we praise you for what you do through us, understanding that it's only as we walk in the Spirit that we'll have this victory. In Jesus' name.